Um, okay, yeah, thanks for the invitation to, to speak about this. It's something I've been getting more and more interested in. And um, I want to give a little bit of a run through of some of the thought processes that we use when we try and make outreach projects or programs. Um, so first, a little bit of background. So I'm from the Francis Crick Institute, which is this kind of spaceship looking building on the slide. Uh, it's right in central London, right next to St Pancras. Um, if you're ever in the area, um, there's often an exhibition going on in the building that's free to public. And there's one that's just opened last week called Hello Brain. So if you are in the area, drop in and check it out. It's always um, very good. Um, and then I was going to mention a bit about, uh, let me just, sorry, move my toolbar out of the way so I can see the slide. Um, so I'm also a member of the Royal Microscopical Society, which is one of the UK's big um, scientific institutions um, or um, organisations. And uh, they actually have a very well-established outreach and engagement scientific section. And they do lots of very cool things like um, ship boxes of microscopes and samples all around um, the country. Uh, they even recently had a couple of electron microscopes that they sent around to schools, which was extremely popular, but obviously a bit more work. Uh, so yeah, do go and check out what's going on on the RMS website. Oh, sorry. Uh, okay, so first of all, we, we want to ask ourselves, what's what are we trying to do? What's the goal of our communication? Sometimes it's a conference and we're, you know, maybe trying to show off our latest publication or maybe trying to get a job um, or sometimes we want to talk to the general public um, to school kids um, then we have to think about what what do we want the audience to get from it do they want do we want them to you know, understand your new tool and use it or do you want are you want to get people interested in going into a career in science um, and yeah you get something out of it too right new collaborators new job uh, new youngsters getting into science to continue the work when we're retired is a, a useful thing as well. Um, and there's a, a, a tweet from one of the primary schools that we've worked with locally, so it'll be a bit more about that later. Um, and the problem that we often get is when you're a scientist, you're very heavily immersed in the thing that you do, and you kind of forget how far you've come, like the, the things you had to learn to get to that stage of understanding. And it's very common to start too high for an audience, especially when you're aiming for general public or, or school kids. So it's really, really crucial that you um, think about what level you, you pitch your um, outreach activities at and how it fits into the, the broader world. And so the way I like to think about this is there's this Nice comic, which I think has got a few people through their PhDs, but I'll, I'll run through it step by step. It's called The Illustrated Guide to a PhD by Matt Might. Um, the, um, and this, you know, it's not just a PhD, it, it applies to any sort of academic endeavours. Um, and, and this is something that um, Matt uses to explain to the new students what a PhD is, because it's a bit nebulous, right? You show up for a few years and you do some stuff. Um, what what what's the actual bigger picture? And the way he explains it is, first of all, imagine a circle that contains all of human knowledge. When you're a kid at school, um, you know a little bit, so you start to fill out this circle. You, you go through higher levels of school, you get to know a bit more. Then maybe if you do a degree, you start to specialise a bit, so you start to move in one particular direction. Maybe you do some um, postgraduate degrees, and then you do a PhD um, or, or you, you start reading research papers, maybe you do a PhD. And at that stage, you're right at the limit of what we know. So you're right at the edge of human knowledge. Um, and the PhD is when you get to this boundary, you battle with the boundary and eventually you break through the boundary, maybe just a little bit, but you supply some new knowledge to the world, right? You've expanded this circle a little bit. Um, and this, this little dent is a PhD. So that's that's the um, the, the sort of foundations that I wanna work with. When you're in your PhD, this is all you see. You just see this little tiny blip um, and you, you kind of forget the bigger picture. So it's very important to remember this 
bigger picture, everything else that exists outside of the um, four years of experiments that, you, that you've just done. Um, and that encourages us to uh, to keep pushing at the boundaries. Um, so, okay, why am I showing you this? Uh, what does this tell us how to communicate our work? Um, if I'm going to a conference where I'm talking to people who do the same thing as me, then I, I only need to talk about things that exist in this little blip, right? All, all of our background knowledge is the same. So we can skip all of the, the background and go straight to the new stuff. Um, but the, the further away your audience members are from your exact domain, the more you have to kind of zoom out and um, backtrack a bit to, to find a common ground. So one example of that might be, you know, somebody who works in something quite similar. So I work in electron microscopy analysis. I have colleagues who work in light microscopy analysis. Um, and we don't do exactly the same thing. We have largely overlapping backgrounds. Instead of now only being able to talk in this little blip, now we have to come back a couple of steps and talk about something a bit more general. We need to come back and find that common ground. And a lot, a lot of academic communication is in this zone, right? So you go to conferences and you see presentations, you read journal articles. There's a huge amount of expected background knowledge to get up to the point of being able to communicate um, those things. When you are talking to school kids, you have to come all the way back here, right? So you, you can't assume really any kind of background knowledge. So if, if I want to tell school kids about the, the fun AI image analysis we're doing, you know, at a conference, I just start talking about that. But if I want to um, tell school kids about this, I have to explain what computational image analysis is. I probably have to explain what a scientific image is. I probably have to explain what an image is. And then you come all the way back to the foundation at primary schools, that then really basic measurement is the, the, the thing that you have to come right back to. So what does, what is an image in the context of making measurements and, and things like that? So it's um, it's a very useful exercise to work out where you need to go for this. It's also true for interdisciplinary communication, which I do a lot as a physicist in the biology institute. Um, this bit where the two backgrounds overlap is often a lot further back than you think. And this can be one of the big problems with these interdisciplinary activities is that the, the misunderstandings that you get from people not quite coming back far enough and, and working to a sort of common foundation. Uh, and th there's a sort of um, educational or psychology um, aspect to this, which is um, something called the zone of proximal development, or some people call it scaffolding. And, and the idea is that there's, if you're teaching somebody something, they can already do some stuff. And then there's a bunch of stuff that they can't do at all. There's a bit in the middle that they can't yet do, but if you give them a bit of help, they can do it. Um, and in, uh, this, this zone is the zone of proximal development. Um, another way of saying this is, the middle bit's obvious and boring, the outer bit's incomprehensible, the middle bit new but can be grasped and is hopefully interesting. So that's really the target. You, you need to find the zone of proximal development for the audience that you're trying to um, teach new things. Okay, so how do you find this level? Um, the, the first thing you have to do is find out what your audience is gonna be. Ask, ask the organizers, find out from teachers or whatever, what do they know? What what's the, a good starting point? Um, unfortunately, academics, myself included, um, often like to recycle talks, and um, sometimes that cannot be appropriate. But the the conference presentations you give are definitely not going to be appropriate to um, give at a school. But you know, it's um, easy, right, to just recycle things. So so. You, Try not to be too lazy and and, and make um, new things. People worry about trying to present things to people that oh they already know all of this. That's fine. It's better to um, have a few people say oh yeah I, I know this already than to have people who are completely lost immediately and uh, you know there's no point in being there. And it's often very enlightening for you to explain your understanding of simple concept X 
to somebody who really understands it because it can give different views on um on these ways of understanding things that, that can be very useful when you don't necessarily expect it um, and i'd say what one, one characteristic of the further away you get from your sort of um, close domain audiences is you need some sort of hook to kind of draw people in you can't just reel out a bunch of you know facts scientific facts you want some sort of hook to make people go wow okay that's amazing look at that or you know school kids especially like oh that's gross it's i love it um so that that kind of hook to get people sort of infused to, to kind of bait the enthusiasm is um very useful uh yeah, if, if you don't know the background and you can't find out, it's always useful to make your presentations a bit more interactive. So ask people um, what they know. So asking the school kids, does anybody know what a cell is? Or does anybody know what a microscope is? Um, it just gets them thinking and moving and talking. And, and it, it's a very useful thing to, to find out where to pitch things. Sometimes you have to adjust on the fly. So I gave a tutorial um a to a sort of a foreign language uh tutorial uh foreign language school um coming to the uk um a tutorial about ai and um it wasn't made totally clear to me that the the level of um english was a little bit lower so i had to kind of halfway through throw out a bunch of stuff and really like okay let's go through this properly let's do something properly cover it well rather than just blast through regardless and you know everyone's wasted a day um and somebody told me once that on average people will take one thing away from your talk so try and make that something you want them to take away from your talk um often with schools people don't consider this so much but um teachers have very tight curriculum they have to stick to so speak to the teacher find out what helps them if you show them something um as part of the outreach um so communicating to the general public um this is it, it's good publicity for us and our employers um i think public understanding of science can be an issue in certain things. So COVID and um, COVID vaccinations and flat earth theory and, and all of this stuff, which is sort of worryingly prevalent. You know, this is a, a symptom of lack of um, good uh, science outreach or education. Um, bear in mind to the public, things that you as an academic think are interesting are probably less interesting, but there are some other things which are completely second nature to you, which might be super interesting. So when Lizzie gave this talk at the point of science a few years ago, the things that people were really interested in was that, you know, green fluorescent protein was cloned from jellyfish and it won the Nobel Prize and the electrons are these crazy particles. And, and so try and um, work out which are the things that are going to engage the, um, the, the attendees. Um, don't underestimate don't underestimate people's interest and capabilities. So dumbing things down too much can be a problem with some outreach. So, you know, have trust in people's ability to, to deal with interesting and complex topics if you explain things well. Um, now, communicating to school kids specifically, there's a big problem with science is still seen in fairly negative light in a lot of schools. So it's too hard or it's not for people like me. Diversity is a massive problem. Um, and this starts at a very young age, right? People decide very young that science is not for me or I don't see people like me uh, doing this thing, so I'm not going to consider it. You know, this standard view of scientists is basically, you know, Einstein, old white man who's a bit kooky. Um, so we need to try and get away from that and um, have people doing outreach and... Um, education that that break those stereotypes um and as i said you you want to make sure that you're covering things that are useful um for the curriculum as much as possible so i'll quickly rattle through some example activities that we've done over the years um so back uh about about 10 years ago back when i couldn't get hold of a fold scope i tried very hard um we we came up with um this other um 
Instructables thing we found online, build a microscope for $10 um, out of nuts and bolts and bits of laser pointers and so on. And we took this to school a few times and it's actually, it's really nice system. So this is some Xenopus um, embryos, uh, zebrafish embryos, like really basic, basic looking instrument can do really cool imaging as, as we've seen from um, Paola. Uh, just recently, we've done a plankton projector, which is also followed on nicely from one of the um, use cases of Foldscope. So you shine a, a laser beam through a little spherical droplet of water, and this is water from my pond with all the little creepy crawlies swimming around. And the kids love this, right? This is um, exactly the sort of um, thing that gets people engaged. And, and these are deliberately simple looking, right? It's, demystifying this idea that microscopes are some big complicated expensive thing really they're quite simple like you can make them expensive and complicated but at that route they can be quite quite simple um we've uh tried to get kids engaged we've we've done some 3d renderings uh, th this was a um going back to things being in the curriculum this was the the, the school was studying um plankton I'm trying to learn about plankton and, and the, the cycle, um, marine life cycles, uh, and just oops, making a uh, 3D rendering and giving them 3D glasses was a real big wow moment for them. And it, it's kind of, it's almost sort of trivial, right? It's, it's kind of you're not learning anything more by having that, but it really got them engaged. And I think that, that's a really useful thing to get um, the interest up. Um, so I do bioimage analysis. Um, the school's current um, theme is uh, Dear Earth. So we've come up with a, an image analysis outreach project now, which we're just about to run, where we use the exact software that we use for um, bioimage analysis, but we're doing um, a climate change project. So we have, have the kids basically replicate this graph of the um, falling sea ice area. And we do that with this really nice web-based image analysis platform um, called Imjoy. Uh, so you can just log on to the website, load in your images. These are um, images from NASA. Uh, a few clicks and you get a bunch of numbers out and you see that Arctic ice is decreasing. And it, it's quite empowering to have them be able to use real scientific images and make that conclusion themselves. Um, one of our big projects at the Crick over the last few years has been something um, in a field called citizen science, which is where you um, engage members of the public via a website to do certain types of analysis. Uh, so we've had them doing um, what we call segmentation, so delineating objects of interest in electron microscope images. Uh, we've had them drawing around nuclei, around mitochondria, around combinations of organelles, um, endoplasmic reticulum. We've been doing correlative light and EM stuff recently. Um, and just our project we're about to release is actually our first one with clinical data um, to, to understand um, immune cells in um, certain types of biopsy. Um, and to do this, to get members of the public to do this, we have to explain it. We can't use the sort of normal scientific terminology we have to explain things in a um clear way and give clear instructions and um have walkthroughs and examples and if you have that information that available to them we found that the results are really excellent so the general public can do excellent science if you if you let them so um i, I think it was quite we were very impressed with really how good the results were coming from this. And of course, this is a great outreach um, tool, right? We've had, we've run sessions at um, Science Museum, uh, Natural History Museum. We've had the Mayor of London drawing around things for us. We've had um, in different exhibitions. It's um, imaging and image analysis is naturally a very engaging thing because it's so visual. So um, trying to, do outreach this way has been uh, very successful for us. Uh, so in summary, sorry, that's quite a fast whistle stop tour. Um, try to make sure that you, that the most important thing is get the level right. Like if, you, if you get that wrong, then you know nobody gets anything from it. 
uh, try not to reuse your old slides. Um, avoid jargon if you can, or if you have to use it, then explain it really well, build that scaffolding, get somewhere in the zone of proximal development. Um, the goal is to get your audience to get something from it. This isn't just padding your CV by you know, saying I've done this many presentations. You want, there's, there's an end goal, which is for other people to benefit from it. Um, I really like, you know, as with Foldscope as well, th this idea that the hands-on work, it really demystif demystifies things and it gives people ownership of understanding the process and understanding that it is something that they can do. Um, and yeah, if uh, generally, yeah, assume people are only going to take one or a very few things away from your talk or from your um, event. So try and make sure it's things you want them to, to take away from it. Uh, and I'll just quickly show there's lots of people in, in our team at the EMSDP uh, run by Lucy Collinson here at the Crick. And um, I think most have been involved at some point in giving some of these outreach projects at our local schools. And I'll finish it. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you so much, Martin. That was a really interesting uh, talk. Um, if you have any questions, then you can uh, type them into the uh, Q&A tab. We have time for, time for a couple. Um, I, I thought it was really interesting to hear you both talked about the importance of having a hook and also engaging with the, the teachers. I mean, how do you go about this process of engaging with the, the schools? So for the Crick, um, and I appreciate the Crick is a fairly unusual place, like not everybody has quite the, the resources and the sort of capacity and dedicated team members to do certain things, but, but the Crick has... Um, in the district of London where we are, Camden, um, it, um, to even really be allowed to be built where it is, it had to sort of promise to contribute to the local community. So we have relationships with all of the local schools. Um, we have a little teaching lab at the Crick. So we have streams of little kids coming in in their tiny little lab coats and tiny benches. Um, so for us, a lot of the relationships have been sort of set up by people above me and you know it's we're able to do that i think generally um the royal microscopical society approach that they have um you know over the years of running the microscope activity kits they've got databases of schools that are interested in these things and i think generally when schools find out that these things are possible you know it a, a lot of them are very interested in in trying it then then the problem becomes scaling it so you know, the, the idea of, um, as Paola was showing, you know, having people who sort of train the trainers and that kind of ripple effect, I think, is something that we aspire to with some of these things. You know, the idea isn't that, you know, we're the only people who can go and give these sessions. The idea is that we can package things up in a way that, you know, maybe given a little bit of training or tutorial, anyone can give that session and it can scale. The software things, I think, I think we're quite hopeful that those scale very well because there's not even a physical bit of hardware that you have to send anywhere. Right, it's just go to this website and and run this sequence of steps. 